Thanks, it's a pleasure to be here today to talk about this subject that is really close to my heart. Um, So I'm a security researcher, but I'm also a patient. Every single beat of my heart is generated by a medical device, a pacemaker that is implanted inside of my body. Five years ago, I woke up lying on the floor. It turned out that I had fallen because my heart had taken a break, long enough to cause unconsciousness. To keep my pulse up, and to stop my heart from taking breaks, I needed to get this pacemaker implanted into my body. This little device monitors each and every single heartbeat and it sends a small electrical signal to my heart to keep it beating. But how can I trust my heart when it's running on proprietary code and there's no transparency? When I got the pacemaker, it was an emergency procedure. I needed to have the device, so there was really no option to not have the implant. It was, however, time to ask questions. To the surprise of my doctors, I began asking about the potential security vulnerabilities in this device and the software running in the pacemakers and the possibilities of hacking it. The answers were unsatisfying. My healthcare providers could not answer my technical questions about computer security. And many of them hadn't even thought about the fact that these devices run code inside of human bodies. This is why I decided to seek out this information myself. Imagine that this is your heartbeat. A heartbeat being controlled by a machine that is running code inside your body. Wouldn't you also like to know if it can be trusted? So my life depends on this hardware and software. So I actually started a hacking project to figure out the security of my own personal critical infrastructure. So here you can see one of the pacemakers opened. So we can look into and see what type of electronics, what type of chips are in there. Here you can see a printout from one of my visits at the hospitals where I had a checkup. And this printout shows that I'm 100% depending on the pacemaker all of the time. So the upper graph, which is at 100%, is how often uh, I'm paced in the ventricle. The bottom chart is how often my atrium is paced, so the lower and the upper heart chamber. The atrium is only paced uh, typically during uh, sleep hours, so this is during a course of 24 hours, and you can see it kicks in uh, when I'm sleeping, and that's mainly because it's configured to only give me a pulse if my pulse drops below 50 beats per minute. So I have a condition that is called AV block. It means that the signal that is created by the sinus node, which is in the upper heart chamber, it gets blocked on the way down to the ventricle. So it doesn't reach the lower heart chamber. And this suddenly happened to me five years ago. And it was easily fixed by the pacemaker. So the pacemaker actually saved my life and it keeps me running and it makes it possible for me to live my life just as I did before this happened to me. So there are two electrodes. One is uh, uh, attached to the upper heart chamber. It usually just listens for our signal to come through. And this signal is created by my sinus node. And then the other electrode listens to see if the electrical pulse travels down to the ventricle and creates a pumping uh, of the ventricle. And as you can see here, 100% of the time, this signal doesn't come through, so it has to generate the pulse for me. So at the time when this happened, I was working pro with protecting no Norwegian critical infrastructure from cyber attacks. I was working at the Norwegian CERT, doing computer emergency response, responding to incidents. 
And I hadn't really thought about security of medical devices or medical implants when this happened. Never thought about that. But of course, when I had this implant, I started to think about this problem. I started to try to get more information about how my pacemaker is working and if I can trust it, if I can know it, that it's actually uh, securing me and protecting me as it should. And I couldn't get the answers I was looking for. So I had to start doing the research myself. I'm now working as a security researcher. I quit my job at the government one and a half year ago to uh, move to another city in Norway and to do security research for a research organization, a research in institute called Sintef. And I was asked to give a talk, a keynote talk actually, one and a half year ago about how it is to be a security researcher and depending on a potentially vulnerable technology like I am. I decided, yes, I'm going to do this talk, but what's going to be my main message? My main message was going to be, we need more research. We need more people looking into these things because we can't really only trust that the vendors have this under control and that the regulators of the vendors are looking into this because they weren't at the time. So I decided to do, use my story to create awareness and to teach. And when I started to look up information about my device, I also realized, OK, I'm complaining. We don't have enough security research on medical devices. Why don't I just do it myself? So that motivated me to start the hacking project. I actually started on my spare time with a couple of friends. And then eventually, after I got some more attention about this, I also managed to get some internal funding from Sintef so that I could work on it a little bit in my day job. So this is what I discovered when I started to look up information about my own implant. The technology is embodied inside of me. It's embedded, embedded devices that were not actually designed originally to be connected the way they are today. So I was surprised when I found out that my device has two wireless communication interfaces. I didn't know that I had this feature in my device that could be used for home monitoring purposes, meaning that my device can connect to the internet. So in a way, I'm a human part of the Internet of Things by having this device inside of me. And no one asked me for my consent before they implanted this, and no one actually informed me that I had this functionality of my device. I only knew about one of the wireless communication interfaces that's used for programming or configuring the device. And this is the communication between the programmer that uh, is in the hospital that they use to communicate with the device and to change its settings so that it can be adjusted to the patient's needs and deliver the suitable therapy. And it's very good that this interface is wireless because you don't want to have another surgery and get opened up every time you need to adjust the configuration uh, or maybe update the software or the firmware on the device. So I knew about this near-field communication. It requires a very close distance to the, uh, the reader. It has a reader head that is uh, placed on top of my chest. And then the technician or the doctor that is uh, controlling the programmer can use a touch screen on the programmer and control my heart. So they can make my heart go faster, slower, or even stop it if they want to. And this is actually something they do every time I'm in for a checkup. They go through a test suite to check that everything is working correctly, and I can feel it on my body. I can feel that this person is controlling my heart. But I was surprised to learn about uh, the home monitoring functionality. Uh, this works that way, that uh, if you have this switched on, 
You also need to have a dedicated device in your home, like a router or an access point uh, that you get from the manufacturer. And you can place this, for instance, on your nightstand in the, in the bedroom. And then once per day or however it's configured, it will set up a communication link with the pacemaker. And this communication link has several meters of communication range. So you don't need to be very close to it. And then it will retrieve information from the device, like log information about the usage of the device, the status of the device, maybe if the patients have had some uh, uh, arrhythmias or things that uh, needs to be recorded. It collects this information and then sends it either over the phone line or, the, or via a 3G uh, network, 4G network, or via the internet. And then there's a server at the vendor where this information is stored. And there's a web interface for the healthcare professionals to log on to to retrieve the patient information. Notice that the patient is out of the loop of this. The patient is not defined as a user of this technology. It's the healthcare personnel that's the user. So it's all kind of uh, not uh, transparent, or the patient doesn't know what's going on. The data just flows. There's no app or GUI or display that can give this information to the patient, which I think is a pity in a way, because a lot of patients could have usage of this information, but it's not uh, allowed for them to look at. And often, this can also be patient information traveling to another country and being stored somewhere else than like the area of your jurisdiction where the patient is currently. So what happens to the data? And this is really valuable data. Imagine if you're an insurance company, for instance, you would be really interested in getting all of this data. So there's a lot of things that needs to be discussed in this situation, but as a security uh, researcher, I see this connectivity as an increased attack surface and a potential vulnerability and a way that this system can get hacked. And that was what I was worried about when I started this project. And I'm still looking into it. It's still a work in pro process. So what could possibly go wrong? if you look at this from a security researcher's standpoint. Of course, there are patient privacy issues. There's sensitive information being stored on these devices, and it's actually also being transmitted wirelessly, um, not necessarily with encryption. So you can, you can actually read out patient information if you have a dedicated uh, equipment and an antenna. You can scan the room for patients wearing various of these devices and get their uh, personal information. Battery exhaustion is a really um, big issue in this uh, case, because uh, these devices have limited battery capacity. And of course, you want them to last as long as possible, because you don't want to have unnecessary surgery. In my case, my pacemaker has a lifetime of 10 years. So in five years, I need to have another surgery and replace it because the battery runs out. And it has been argued that the reason you cannot implement good enough security on these devices is because it would use too much resources in terms of using up the battery. But I think uh, it's worth uh, uh, looking a bit closer into that and looking at solutions that uh, there, there are solutions for lightweight cryptography and uh, ways of implementing security that can actually uh, protect uh, the wearers of the devices without using too much battery. I don't know if you I will come back to this, but there's another group of researchers that have published some work on uh, looking into a different brand of devices than the ones that I've been looking into. And they found that uh, the developers had uh, 
tried to put in some cryptographic protection by implementing authentication using RSA, but then they only had used 24-bit keys, which is kind of, uh, if you're a security or crypto person, 24-bit key length is just uh, laughable. It's no protection at all. So it uh, just shows that uh, implementation of security in this device is really needs to be uh, looked into by third parties. Uh, of course, you can make the device malfunction by hacking it. You can also think about worse scenarios, like putting ransomware on medical equipment, uh, threatening people's lives. Uh, so pay or we will turn off your pacemaker. That's kind of scary. Um, and ransomware has been really um, fashionable lately. A lot of uh, uh, hospitals have been hit by ransomware, and also in Germany and worldwide. And they actually had to turn away patients and shut down their operation because they couldn't access their IT systems due to all their files being encrypted. And they had to pay bitcoins to try to get them back, which is not. Uh, just shows that you have bad um, contingency plans and plans uh, for backups and rolling back to backups, in my opinion. And of course, you can think about the things you've seen in like uh, TV series and movies, like remote assassination scenarios. So if you are the vice president or the president and you were uh, of America and you were a pacemaker, you should maybe be a bit worried about this. So can we trust the machines? And I'm not saying only, there, there are a lot of people that have medical implants but in the future, I'm sure that a lot of you in this audience will also have different types of sensors and implants, like variables. We already go around with personal area networks, and we're trusting this technology. Maybe we should think a little bit more about what signals we are emitting all the time and how this can be used to track us or to hurt us. Can we trust that this technology that is here for our benefit, for our convenience, isn't actually turning against us and hurting us in the future. So I'm showing you this slide because you're a bunch of software developers, mainly, I guess, or architects. How many of you heard about the building security in maturity model? Okay. A couple of you, good. I'm going to let Gary McCrow know about this. So uh, BSIM study, that's a study of what are the practices, software development practices at a large number of firms. I think it's uh, around 100 firms that have been measured by, uh, in this study. And they have divided the, the secure software development practices into 12 different uh, areas, and then there's a score uh, on each area where you can measure yourself against what is the best current standard or practice in the business of how are others doing software development and building security into their products. <coughs> and I want to show you this graph because it shows that the healthcare sector is really lagging behind. So in this uh, spider sh uh, chart, you can see two different uh, types of sectors compared to each other. The green one is the cloud, so companies that are working within cloud. And it's a pretty new area, I would say, but it seems like they're actually adopting a lot of secure coding practices because they, they're not uh, like in the middle of the, of the plot. But the orange one is the, the firms that are within the healthcare sector that has been, have been measured. And you can see that they are in almost all areas, except, I guess, for compliance and policy, uh, they are behind the cloud guys, which is not a good thing. So I really hope that uh, the firms that are developing software for medical devices and for the healthcare sector 
focus more on building security into the projects in the future, and we will see better results from these types of measurements. So why are we in this mess? Why hasn't it been focused on securing medical devices and devices that are potentially uh, responsible for keeping people alive? So the problem is, of course, long lifetime of these products and devices. Like I said, my t I'm going to have my pacemaker in my body for 10 years, and it probably took five years maybe to develop it and to get it approved for the market. So the technology that's inside of me, and that is sort of connecting to the internet, is maybe 10, 15 years old, which is not a good thing. So we have to live with a lot of legacy technology in this area. In some cases, it's, pos it's possible to update or patch uh, the devices. I didn't know when I started this project whether or not my pacemaker could be patched. Was I patchable or unpatchable? <laughs> so that's the title of the talk. But actually, in looking into these things, uh, I discovered that it's possible to upload new firmware to the pacemaker via the programmer. But anyway, there's a lot of medical equipment out there that can't be patched or it's hard to patch them, or you might not have the uh, uh, procedures in place to do the patching. There's a big log logistical problem too. If you have a recall of hundreds and thousands of devices inside the people, you need to get them to the hospital, you need to perform the surgeries in case you can't patch them and so on. And also, medical devices are black boxes. They are not third-party testing. Uh, and often, the way these devices get approved for the market doesn't really imply that they are thoroughly tested. It's like a uh, testing of the documentation of the, how they are produced. And they're running on proprietary software, so uh, even if I have the skills to do an uh, audit of it, I cannot access it. And also, everything gets more and more connected. It's more connectivity, and there's a lack of regulations, and it, this opens up for an increased tech surface. So what can we do to make it better? I'm not only here to scare you or to make you feel depressed. I want to solve things. I want more security research, as I mentioned. And that also means more collaboration between the security researchers, the, developer, uh, the developers, the manufacturers, and the regulators, the authorities. You need to have uh, coordinated disclosure processes in place and a way for researchers that discover vulnerabilities in these things to know how to deal with it and how to uh, make the manufacturer actually care about fixing it. Vendors need to be made aware, and this can be done by kind of forcing them or forcing you uh, by regulation, but also in procurement. The buyers of the devices can start to ask questions and can start to make, um, uh, uh, make the vendors have to answer for these things. And of course, building security in so that in the future we actually thought about securing these embedded, embodied devices and testing them. And then when we have uh, to live with all the legacy devices and the way it is today, we need to monitor the risks continuously. We need to have measures in place to do security updates. Incident response means that when things go wrong, we have a plan for how to deal with it. Cyber insurance might be something that can uh, help in the future if they start uh, uh, pressuring the vendors. And we need to have resilience, resilient products that can handle that something goes wrong, which we, in a way, already have because safety has been a real focus on these devices that I'll come back to in my personal stories <laughs> about living with this device. So part of the solution is to work together with the different stakeholders to collaborate. And I've done my part in this by joining um, grassroots movements, 
movement called I Am The Cavalry. It's a collection of a group of people that try to get together and work together to solve these things. And we have members there from uh, security researchers, uh, people that work for the manufacturers, people that work with regulation and, and, uh, and uh, also people with some medical background, actually. One year ago, we published the five, these five um, different steps that we call the Hippocratic Oath for Connected Medical Devices. And these are five things we want the vendors, the manufacturers to focus on in order for future products to be safe and secure for the patients. So one is, as I mentioned, cyber safety by design, that we, we know that things will fail at one point, so we need to build in measures so that not everything fails when it goes wrong. That's also part of the resilience and containment. But try to make secure products for the future, products that actually use real cryptography, for instance. Uh, Third-party collaboration, engaging with the different parties to work together to avoid failure. Evidence capture. That's another thing I think is really important. What are the forensic capabilities of medical devices? So far, there's no uh, cases where we can prove that someone has died because of hacking, because of exploitation of security vulnerabilities of a medical implant. But people have died because uh, software bugs and uh, bad code in the firmware. But how do we know? Because there's a lot of cases that are not investigated and not reported as being maybe caused by failure of uh, medical devices, because we don't have really a good system for catching these events. And we don't have the specialists to be able to do forensics and examination of the medical implants and figure out what actually went wrong. In some cases, medical devices are sent back to the manufacturer if they suspect that something is wrong with them, and it's up to the manufacturer to do their own investigation and try to figure out what went wrong. But in many cases, there's no such thing. And cyber safety updates I already mentioned. It's really important that we have a capability to actually patch things. So I'm going to switch talking a little bit more about my personal story and why I'm hacking my own heart. Um, the first time I was kind of victim for a software <coughs> problem with my device was only four or five weeks after the implant. I was back at work and I was sent to London to attend a course it was a course in ethical hacking, actually. And I was uh, out in London riding the underground with some colleagues, and we went off at Covent Garden Station, which is an underground station that's really far below the ground. And there's this very long staircase that we started to walk to get out of the station. And I came at... The, so this was the first time I actually tried to do any kind of exercise after my surgery and after having my implant. Before I had the implant, I was a pretty fit person. I could run and exercise and train as normal. I came halfway up the stairs. I felt something was wrong. It was like I was suddenly turned into an 80-year-old. It was so hard to get up the remaining of the stairway. I almost felt like I was hitting the wall and like crashing. I, almost like I could not go on. But I managed to get up the stairs, and I was kind of recovering, and I felt okay again. But then when I came back to Norway, I called my hospitals and said, there's something wrong with the pacemaker. This thing happened to me in the stairs. We need to figure this out. So I went back and forth, back and forth, for three months until they could figure out what was wrong with my pacemaker. It turned out there was a configuration setting that was the problem. Once my pulse hit 160 beats per minute, it was suddenly cut to 80 beats per minute. So I couldn't get enough oxygen, and of course I felt like an eight-year-old. 
And the reason, I guess, is this was a default setting because these implants are usually implanted into 80-year-olds, so they don't need to get uh, that high up in pulse. Uh, the problem was that when we tried to figure this out, uh, the upper rate limit, the, the number that was di displayed on the user, uh, or on the screen, the GUI that the pacemaker technician was looking at, it was not the correct number. So there was a calculation error in the software, in the programmer, that made this more challenging to figure out. So I had to get up in a, a treadmill and do exercise until they saw what was actually happening. So I guess it's a, a combination of human error and problem with the technology that made this happen. But it was not a really dangerous thing, but it was really problematic, and I felt bad for three months. I couldn't exercise, I couldn't run after a bus or anything. So this motivated me. So I started the hacking project. Uh, I actually went on eBay and I bought the programmer for $500. So I have the programmer that is used in the hospital and we're using it and uh, like hacking it. Uh, also got a lot to hold of all these different uh, home monitoring units. They were really easy to get hold of on eBay. Not very expensive. I guess someone's cleaning out their old uh, grandparents' uh, um, flat and just selling things on eBay. Problem was getting hold of pacemakers, but if, because of course I don't want to use my own pacemaker uh, in the project in the research. Uh, but I was so lucky to get some donations, uh, so people actually sent me pacemakers, old used pacemakers in the mail, so that I can use them in the project. These are some of the different, these are home monitoring units from, th from three different vendors. Um, and one of these uh, has become a bit famous in the news because of the research that MedSec, the other group of researchers have been doing. This is the, the Merlin at home transmitter. Now you can see from the lab when we're looking into uh, this, uh, com the wireless communication signals from the programmer to the pacemaker. So this is work in progress, and I am following um, coordinated disclosure procedures, so I won't be um, telling you any results of this yet. But I had this thing happening to me in September last year that actually kind of progressed my uh, hacking project. Because we've been trying to get hold of the code running on my pacemaker, and that's not so easy to get hold of. But while I was flying to give a talk at a conference in uh, Amsterdam, in Netherlands, my pacemaker suddenly failed while I was up in the air. It turned out that most likely, the memory of my pacemaker was hit by cosmic radiation that caused a bit flip or more than one bit flip and corrupted the memory. So the pacemaker had to switch into something called a safe backup mode. And I felt this on my body. I could feel that my heart was beating much uh, harder. I could see my chest muscle was twitching and it was kind of scary. So when, I, when we landed uh, in Schiphol, there was an ambulance waiting for me that took me directly to the hospital. And this is me uh, actually with a smile on my face because here, this is right after uh, um, I had to spend one night in the hospital and then pacemaker technician came with the different programmers. So here you can see programmers from four different vendors. Of course, you need to have a dedicated programmer to your model of pacemaker, because they're talking on proprietary communication protocols. So we need to have the correct programmer for the correct pacemaker. That's why there's a stack of them. And he had interrogated my, my pacemaker, and I knew it was a problem with the software, not the hardware. <laughs> so it could be fixed. This is the face of the pacemaker technician when he looked at the programmer, and he saw this error message 
which she has never seen before. So there was a data error in Pacemaker. It is running a backup program. And this backup program kind of saved me, because it could, could still work, even though it could not access its, uh, its memory. It switched off up the uh, voltage that I could feel, and it turned into another type of pacing that made my muscle twitch. But you can also see select memory dump plus reinitialize button. So that's what happened. The pacemaker was reinitialized, reset. I got the firmware uploaded again, and it was back to factory settings. So luckily, I had a printout of all my settings. It's like this long. So there's more than 20, 30 settings that you have to configure on the device. So we could get it back to the same uh, 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 configuration as originally, and I could get out of the hospital, and I was free to go and give my talk. So I survived. And also, they did a memory dump of my device. And I managed to get hold of this memory dump. So I have now <laughs> in my possession the code running in my heart, like the memory dump of this. So kind of progressed also the hacking project a little bit. You cannot always trust that these devices have the correct security. Uh, already mentioned this case. Um, group of security research from researchers from the uh, US, a startup company called MedSec. They did very similar research, like the research I'm doing. And they found vulnerabilities in centered medical devices, and particularly in their home monitoring system. <coughs> and these researchers did something quite original. Instead of alerting the vendor or contacting the FDA, the regulator in the US, they decided to make money on their fi findings by uh, sort of licens licensing their research to an investor firm called Muddy Waters. Muddy Waters shorted the stocks in Century Medical, and then they released the report, and they made money because of the, short the shorting of the stocks. So you can see here that the, the um, price of the stocks dropped dramatically, like 7 percent points after this news. And that's how they made money in it. You can, of course, debate the, how ethical this is, because they didn't try to reach out to the vendor first to tell about their findings about vulnerabilities. And their defense is that they had previously, uh, this vendor had a bad reputation for not taking these types of reports seriously. And this is the way they could inflict the most pain on the manufacturer and make them take this seriously. So what they did or claimed to do in the report was that they could access the home monitoring router and get root on it, the telemetry router. They were able to crash the pacemaker by attacking it from the home monitoring device. And they could also exhaust the battery by running malicious code on the home monitoring unit that would constantly try to uh, connect with the pacemaker and therefore drain its battery. At the same time, or just a couple of months later, so this was in August last year, or end of August. In October last year, Century Medical notified their customers about a problem with the battery, the hardware of the battery in these devices. So there were a couple of models, like 400,000 of devices out there in the market that had an issue that could potentially make the battery run out within 24 hours. And two patients actually died because of this fault. So the advice that the MedSec and Muddy Waters researchers gave to patients was, you should switch off home monitoring units because of hacking problems. And then, two months later, the manufacturers come out with this 
advisory. There's a problem with the hardware of some of these pacemakers, or, and, and uh, not pacem pacemakers, but implanted cardiac devices that can make the battery run out and therefore kill the patient. So you need to have the home monitoring switched on at all times, because this will give you an alert in case the battery runs out. And like thousands, hundreds of thousands of patients were in a situation where they were waiting to get a new implant, to get a new surgery, to have a replacement of the recalled device. And they were told that they need to have the home monitoring on at all time. But at the same time, there's a problem with this home monitoring unit maybe being hacked. And it took six months until so this is the, the advice from the FDA about the premature battery depletion problem, affecting some of the same devices. And then it wasn't until January, just a couple of weeks ago, that the FDA released this advisory of the cybersecurity risks. So it means that they had to work for six months with the vendor, with the manufacturer, in order to make an advisory, and also uh, the vendor made a patch, a software update, to try to patch, to patch one of the security vulnerabilities in the home monitoring units. And all this time, patients have been left without knowing what to do. So it's a big problem when you have this type of not coordinated vulnerability disclosures. But I would like to end this talk by saying that for me, of course, the benefit of having the device outweighs the risks. I'm here today, I can deliver this talk, and I actually managed to finish running a half marathon, uh, running with the pacemaker. So without this technology, I would probably not be here today. And of course, even though there are security vulnerabilities. I'm so happy that we have the potential, the potential to save a lot of patients and human lives because of this technology. So in the future, I hope it's also it's safe and it's secure. And I want to say that I'm not the only person that's working on this project. I have had a lot of help from other fellow researchers and friends. And this is just some of the people that I want to mention and say thank you to. And also, thank you. I think I left some minutes for questions, or did I? Did we have time? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really amazing. And um, we know it's, it's 12 and it's lunchtime, but I really think we should take a few, a few questions here because we, you brought in so many great questions. So looking at the first one, is there any known case where personal health hardware has actually been hacked? Are you aware of any exploits that may exist? So the exploits that exist or the, like, there have been some proof of concepts or Vitat researchers or secu academic security researchers showing that it's possible to hack these devices. But I'm not aware that anyone has been hurt, in, hurt by, by hacking or exploits directed uh, at them um, by people with bad intentions. Okay. Um, do you consider all medical device manufacturers to be intentionally ne neglecting security issues of their product? I don't think it's intentionally neglecting. I think it's just the lack of awareness and very strong focus on safety and not security of these devices. So we have, when you have the choice between making uh, something safe to use, you usually think about intention intentional usage of the product. You don't think about the product being used against you or used in malicious ways. So I, I think it's not uh, intentionally designed with bad security. You just haven't been part of the process or part of the, uh, what the regulators have been focusing on or what's been uh, the thing that customers have asked about. 
So, and the doctors have the duty to inform the patient on the medical risks. What do you think that doctors have to inform on technical and security risks in the future? Yeah, this is a big challenge because healthcare personnel, they are not necessarily specialists on technology, but they have to be in a way in order to answer these types of questions that we will have more of in the future, I think. So, uh, we also need to train healthcare pers personnel and doctors into having awareness of these risks. And I want to take the last question, which is, are you in direct contact to manufacturers? Do you get devices to analyze? I've been in direct contact, but I still haven't gotten any hold of any devices directly from the manufacturers to analyze. Uh, but there are other ways of getting hold of those devices. Okay. Thank you very much, Mo. Thank Thanks. you.